Good afternoon. Welcome to the Ephemera Society of America's first virtual conference for 2024. I'm David Lilburn, the current president of the association, and welcome you here today. Um, you know, in getting ready for this, I was uh, thinking there are some good things that have come out of the lockdowns we've had over the last few years. And one of them was the embracing of the virtual format for the ephemera society. This has been a big boon. We've, we're able to reach wider audiences, uh, have speakers that we could never get. And we're, uh, well, I'm very happy we're able to do this. So what we traditionally have is just the um, uh, fair and and uh, conference in Greenwich. Once again, we are going to have that on the 15th to the 17th of March this year. And I encourage everyone to sign up and come along to that as well. Uh, in person, uh, we will be having our annual general meeting at that time. We will be holding emerging scholars talks and uh, we will also have the ephemera fair, which I look forward to year after year. It's great. Um, today, I'm particularly excited. We have uh, two uh, of my um, Putnam County neighbours giving presentations, um, both of whom I highly regard for their research skills and knowledge. Um, and fortunately, I, we get a lot of different speakers over time talking about subjects that they've studied. But what I like is when a collector is talking about their area, because you get those insights you don't get when you have, uh, uh, well, I, I just feel you get the inside story. So um, Sarah, Sarah Johnson today is going to be talking about rural free delivery, parcel post, and opposition to department stores and mail order houses. A very relevant topic given the growth of Amazon today and the demise of walk-in stores and malls. And then our second speaker, uh, Evie Eisenberg, is on the traditional pigtail, to cut or not to cut. Um, This is less topical, but uh, because the you know the the Chinese pigtail went out of style uh, over a hundred years ago, but nevertheless, really fascinating, um, especially for me um, that has a tea collection and, and uh, specialising a lot in Chinese. So there's a crossover between the two of us. Before I do the introductions, um, let's get a couple of housekeeping points in order. If you wish to ask a question, please do so in question and answer, uh, not the chat box. Uh, Vice President Mike Pike is standing by. He will be uh, assembling the questions and asking the, uh, uh, the, the presenters. So uh, questions and answers. Um, uh, there'll be a short break after Sarah's presentation and Evie's going to start at 3.30. Um, then at 4.30, uh, Ephemera Society members are invited to attend a preview of the virtual um, book fair that our old friend Marvin Getman is running. Uh, if you're not a member, well, shame on you, but well, I shouldn't be so I shouldn't be so <laughs> blunt there. Um, I do encourage you to sign up uh, and and get in early. I've been seeing Marvin's advertisements for this with their little teaser emails, and there's some wonderful material and worth getting in. If you're not a member, uh, entry is tomorrow, Saturday at midday. So I encourage you to sign up and um, do that. I, I think that's it for housekeeping. Um, so let me move right on and uh, introduce Sarah. Uh, Sarah sent her CV in 
And uh, I must say, reading through it, Sarah, it's very comprehensive. <laughs> let, me, let me quote it to you. Sarah Johnson is an American historian with 20 years of experience uh, uh, teaching design. Sorry, my handwriting is atrocious. Teaching design history in higher education and over 10 years of experience in public history. Currently, she is on the steering committee of a European Union research group, ACORSO. Well, that might be our first question to you later, Sarah, what <laughs> that is. That is through the University of Brighton. She is working on a manuscript project about the history of mail order catalogues. She is also an author, international keynote speaker. Her research has been funded by the Smithsonian Institution, National Museum of American History, the Hagley Museum, the Winterter Museum, and the UC Santa Barbara Library. She has also worked in not-for-profit museums and academic administration. With that, I'll turn the floor over to you, Sarah. Please. Thanks, David. And thank you for being such a great dealer. Uh, you will see a catalog <laughs> that I bought from you guys in this presentation. Oh, crumbs. Okay. Oh, come on. I don't know why this isn't going. Try to hit uh, play from start under slideshows. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, so just as a housekeeping thing, if anybody wants to see um, the slide on the right, if you just go up to the box where the speakers are, the attendees are, you can hit the little bar on the left side and that will reduce that. Um, so you can see more of the images here. Um, thanks very much for giving me this opportunity to uh, share this research. Um, I'm a collector of ephemera and have been collecting um, for about 35 years um, and have been working on the history of mail order and department stores basically all of my professional life. So um, this is a compilation of a lot of material. Um, today we're going to talk about um, opposition to things that you probably take for granted or don't even think about in a contemporary sense. Um, um, rural free delivery, um, parcel post, um, and mail order houses and, and uh, department stores. <clears throat> um, so we will um, start off with some key terms here. Rural free delivery uh, was offered by the U.S. Post Office Department um, as a service that started as a trial uh, in 1896, in the fall of 1896, um, to deliver mail to farm family homes directly. Um, it first started in West Virginia uh, and a few other states. Um, and then people had, farm families had to actually petition to get signatures of support um, to get roots established um, through, uh, through the post office department and usually their representatives in Washington, DC. Uh, it became an official service in 1902. Uh, there was a four pound package limit. So if you think of a four pound bag of sugar, say, um, that's how big you could send packages through the mail since 1879. Um, larger packages had to be shipped either by express, private express companies uh, or uh, by, via freight uh, and the railroads. Uh, parcel post, on the other hand, and it's sometimes referred to as parcels post in the plural um, in the period, uh, it was another um, uh, legislation, federal legislation that was implemented um, by Congress um, during uh, 18... Uh, 1812, uh, and it actually started January 1st, 19, yeah, 1913. Um, packages then could be up to 11 pounds, and gradually that got the weight, um, maximum weight got increased as we went. Um, and mail order advertising, as defined by Calkins and Holden in 1905 in modern advertising, um, whereby goods are sold direct to the consumer by mail, uh, the consumer in most cases living remote from the mail order house. 
Um, so we'll take a look at um, the traditional primary historical sources here, as well as the ephemera that I've collected um, over the years. I have probably have 40 or 50 mail order catalogs in my collection and quite a lot of related ephemera. Um, so let's just have a look at some of the earlier advertising um, because it's it seemed unfair to uh, launch into opposition in the late 19th century without looking at the development and evolution of things that came before. Um, but clearly, um, mail order um, is illustrated in magazine advertising. Um, the ad on the left is from Harper's Bazaar from 1869, just after the Civil War. Where in the bottom of that ad, it says all inquiries by letter promptly answered. <clears throat> and the image on the right uh, was in a publication called the Christian Union. Um, and it uh, was actually um, uh, from 1879. Uh, and if you look at it, you can see it says uh, send a penny postal card specifying what is desired to John Wanamaker's Grand Depot. Um, that's the first one that I have found so far, and I, that's a dare. I dare you to look in your collection and find something earlier than that um, that specifies using postal cards uh, for consumers. Um, and we'll have a look at those as we um, evolve through this talk as well. Um, here's just a smattering of newspaper advertising um, that, again, uh, uh, talk about orders by mail. Um, the uh, it, on the left side, the kind of uh, beige colored one is the back of a Christian Union from November of 1882, where again, um, we have some orders by mail um, specified there in that lineup of department stores, uh, mostly New York department stores. Um, and then the newspaper on the right um, is all in, in Spanish. Um, it's uh, from a newspaper uh, from Tucson, which I think is still uh, territorial. Arizona Territory at that point uh, in 1887. Um, and the Montgomery, but the interesting thing to me is that the Montgomery Ward advertisement, um, which is the one with the circle um, on the right side in the middle, um, is all in English. Um, so um, anyway, the, the language issue uh, was dealt with in terms of um, the mail order houses by, uh, mo in most of the catalogs, they would specify that they had um, people um, who spoke a number of languages, again, that directly related to the number of immigrants, um, European and otherwise, in this country that um, could uh, enable then um, those people um, explaining what it was that they wanted in their native language, um, and then hopefully getting it from the, uh, from the company. <clears throat> And um, on the left uh, are some ordering forms from 1882 um, that came in a catalog that I got from David. Um, and on the right, uh, a relatively new acquisition, um, a Montgomery Ward uh, invoice um, from, from the, I think it's, this is from the late 1880s um, from Montgomery Ward um, for a, a, um, a consumer JD loss in Riggs, Iowa. Um, you will see as we move throughout the course of this talk that there's a fair number of examples from Iowa, which is this my state of origin. Um, and part of this work was also funded, um, I'm writing an article for their journal, The Annals of Iowa, um, through the State Historical Society of Iowa. Um, so anyway, a shout out to Iowa in that regard, but there's lots of material from the rest of the country represented here as well. Um, and the interesting thing to me is that um, then if you uh, employ um, the genealogical research, say, for example, I did find um, the Loss family um, in this uh, really small town in Iowa, Riggs, Iowa, um, in um, the 1880 newspapers um, and in some uh, military um, records. So uh, the people there, there's ways of tracking these people down as well as keeping track of, I have a running database of people who were ordering for mail order that has grown considerably since I worked on my dissertation um, which was my doctoral work about um, the history of mail order catalogs in uh, American department stores in the second half of the 19th century. Um, this is a little uh, kind of more a little pamphlet um, of Montgomery Wards, this one from 1895. Um, on the back of the pamphlet, it says, Our Territory, the World. Um, and in fact, Montgomery Ward um, had an export department where they dealt with um, consumers all over the globe. Um, and began to do so presumably in the late 1880s uh, with regard to um, missionaries who were um, being posted abroad. 
um, anyway, that's the subject of a separate article that I'm writing, but the, <clears throat> the man um, who was in charge of that department actually was one of the people who was very uh, instrumental in getting uh, the US Post Office Department uh, to pass uh, International Parcel Post, which extends packages throughout the course of the world as well. Uh, so we're just going to run through some catalog covers quickly here. Um, these are some from the 1880s, where again, um, illustrations um, are not particularly uh, prolific in these, uh, largely because um, Generally speaking, um, department stores are manufacturing goods in-house, and if they're doing that, they have to pay for um, illustrations and cuts um, of the of the things that they're selling. Um, so that's why you get a lot more textual descriptions in these earlier catalogs. Here's a couple of them from the 1890s. Uh, and here's a smattering of them from the early 20th century. Um, Macy's from 1904-5, the Grossman's um, from 1900, and the Montgomery Ward from 1910. Um, but the part of the tricky process of mail order um, was that you couldn't uh, um, you couldn't send uh, a letter with the package, or it would go at the much higher rated um postage uh it had to go as first class then um so if you think about how you get packages now um all of the paperwork you know your invoice or your receipt or your return number um all of that is included um but in fact if things were coming through the US postal service um that had to run and run under a separate cover um, so that's where, if anybody's a postcard or postal card collector, um, you may have seen in your looking at things um, a number of these. And I just put together this um, on the left side is the front of these postal cards and on the uh, right side is the backs of them. These range from 1902, uh, it goes 1902, 1904, 1906, um, 1913, and then 1916. Um, and again, the first couple of them just being... Um, uh, just letting consumers know that their orders have been received. Um, the second one, um, uh, there are the in the second row on the left, uh, goods have been returned. Uh, so that's in process. On the right, it's about freight, uh, that their freight delivery is coming to them. Uh, and the bottom left uh, hand corner um, actually gives a credit of 21 cents for that particular consumer's order because they had overpaid. Um, and then uh, while it's a later postcard, probably from the 1920s or 30s, um, it gives you a sense of what the um, Sears Roebuck um, wrapping and shipping department actually looked like. And Sears did a whole series of those cards where they illustrated a number of their departments um, that, again, provide some nice glimpses into um, the process of all of this. But we can really tell the story of mail order with ephemera, extant ephemera. Um, this one, um, Montgomery Ward's collection department um, on a local bank in Kansas City uh, for a consumer in Pratt, Kansas, um, turning over $13.22 for their order that had come by freight. <clears throat> Um, and if we look at um, references in literature, uh, there's a, a number of um, novels uh, that were written, Fanny Herself um, by Edna Ferber, um, uh, Croy, there's a novel called, the novel that I'm reading right now that I'm embarrassed to say, I can't think of his first name, um, uh, that's Rural Free Delivery Number 3. Um, so part of what... Um, the issue was was uh, greater mail service uh, being brought to farm families every day um, broke the uh, broke down the isolation for those families. Um, but uh, in fact, that was not necessarily always seen as a good thing. So there's um, the possibility of romance for some of these young women who were living relatively isolated lives. Um, and then the um, rural free delivery man would come every day. Um, so there's a number of different formats of these postcards um, that were sent um, in, in the, especially in the early 20th century, again, in that kind of golden age of postcard usage, um, not least of all because rural free delivery um, opens up communications and gives people a chance to um, write to their friends and, and relatives uh, a lot more often, a lot more frequently than if they had to hitch up the horse and drive their wagon into town um, to get their mail as they had to do before rural free delivery. 
Okay. Um, a number of especially uh, cons consumer historians, um, especially the Marxists, like to think of um, consumers as having the same or greater consumptive power, uh, regardless of um, the year that they're talking about. Um, but one of the things that I have uncovered in my work is that um, both consumers and retailers and wholesalers um, really struggle with the financial panics that uh, are uh, that pop up th over the course of the um, second half of the, well, really the entire 19th century um, and particularly well into the 20th century. And if we think of that um, in terms of current inflation, you know that you may have in fact the same amount of money, but your money doesn't buy uh, as much in terms of goods. That's been uh, particularly prolific uh, in terms of grocery prices in a contemporary sense. Um, but it was equally true in the um, after the Panic of 1893, um, and this chart just sort of shows where it dips down that center line, uh, shows how bad those financial panics get. Um, the panic in 1893 was really bad, 97 was less bad, um, the panic in 1907, 1908 is especially bad. Uh, but again, I think that it's important to take a look at and keep in mind economic conditions generally, um, and then ways that um, retailers and uh, producers of goods have to figure out how to get people to buy things, even if they have less money. Um, so part of what winds up happening then uh, it, in the aftermath of the financial panic of 1893, uh, where credit becomes inordinately hard to get uh, your hands on, both in terms of um, retailers uh, and uh, especially for consumers, um, is that department stores uh, continue to grow in the last quarter of the of the 19th century um, into um, relatively large, um, well-financed, um, uh, sometimes multi, uh, again, the, the numbers of departments um, expand exponentially in this period of time. Um, so if you think about those giant uh, catalogs that are, you know, sometimes 1200 pages long, um, that's um, who the local merchants are ha having to compete with um, and the economy of scale that they can then take back to manufacturers um, and buy their goods for on a wholesale basis is significantly less than um, the local Main Street um, dealers. Um, so um, a as a result of that, there was uh, actually an anti-department store movement that begins in Chicago in 1897. Um, and this, uh, the postcard on the right uh, declares that war uh, where uh, this, uh, the Businessmen's Association, the 31st Street Businessmen's Association in Chicago um, actually takes it to um, uh, the state Senate and, and tries to make the, the legal form of the department store illegal. Um, that winds up being true uh, or that movement then spreads to about six or eight other states in this country. Uh, although ultimately none of those are, none of those movements are successful. Um, it does create a fair amount of um, agitation, uh, particularly within um, the business community and how business uh, owners can, um, again, attempt to survive given the competition that they're facing. Um, and the, the editorial on the left in the Windy City um, was from uh, Printers Inc. Uh, the end of March. So that this really gets going um, in the winter of 1897. Um, and uh, in fact, it, they talk about how the, the members say that they will stay at the Capitol uh, in Springfield, Illinois, until the anti-department store bill becomes a law. Um, um, I'm going to cheat and tell you that it didn't, in fact, become a law or in any of the other states, but um, the movement itself then morphs into an anti-rural free uh delivery movement um, and an anti-parcel post movement that kind of take up the, the impetus and the energy of that movement. Um, and of course, then uh, retailers themselves respond to that. Um, this is a very small uh, uh, clipping from an advertisement by Carson Prairie Scott, uh, a Chicago department store um, called Honesty in Advertising, where they call out one clause in the anti-department store bill before the legislature penalizes advertising untruths. 
Um, so they're basically saying, we're telling the truth about the goods that we sell. <clears throat> and this is again, um, in the, you know, the spring kind of shopping season for people. Um, this one from the Chicago Tribune, uh, March 21st, 1897. Um, so they're certainly responding at their responding to the anti-department store movement. They're not just um, sitting quietly by and letting um, these detractors have their way. Um, again, New York State was another of the states that um, uh, attempted to pass anti-department store legislation. Um, and this, um, the cover on the left, the pink one, uh, we propose to cooperate with and not against the local dealer in his battle against the encroachments of the mail order houses. Um, so their language gets um, fairly extreme as well. And we don't even know who sent that. They're, they kind of use that as their tagline um, on their envelopes. Um, that one being mailed from Chicago in 1901. So again, this also spills over. Officially, it, it ends, the legislation dies in 1897, um, but the movement itself uh, continues on. Um, and then the um, um, the bad copy of the uh, this little snippet, this little quip from the Postville, Iowa Review newspaper uh, from the fall of 1897, um, his fear. And Rickson says, why don't you vote for Platter, the anti-department store candidate? And Dixon says, I'm afraid if they abolish the department stores, my wife will want a bigger allowance. Um, so again, he's um, noting the economy of scale that his wife is buying things for for their household in that little joke. Uh, and we see opposition, again, from a lot of the uh, the trade, the retail trade journals uh, and organizations, particularly in this period of time when they have their annual meetings, um, which tended to be regional. Um, and that seems to be happening all across the country um, in all, you know, in, in steam fitters and plumbers and um, wholesale grocers and furniture makers and um, farm implement dealers, you name it. Uh, and they probably, uh, if, uh, if mail order catalogs had the kinds of goods that they were selling, they were probably um, fighting back. So um, we have these, and uh, this is, a, I have to do a quick shout out to Leo Landis, who's the Iowa State historian for um, sending along these two clippings. Um, the one on the left, uh, Parcels Post Plan Ruinous, uh, where again, it um, goes through and mentions a number of um, uh, the League of Fourth Class Postmasters who again were threatened with the loss of those very little kind of village post offices uh, when rural free delivery gets more established. Um, and um, so the fourth class postmasters fight back um, as well as um, again, on the, um, the council bluffs paper on the right um, where the wholesale grocers are fighting the new rural route plan. <clears throat> um, and all of this, again, was uh, contentious and uh, argued about in Congress for, uh, you know, over the decades, um, really beginning in the late 1880s, um, when uh, Philadelphia retailer John Wanamaker uh, is uh, and he's at the top right um, of the Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper there, um, becomes uh, Postmaster General in the Benjamin Harrison's um, presidency. Um, that one from March 19, uh, 1889. Um, and the opposing editorial, which again was published in the New York Times um, in 1914, that uh, is again, um, a, one of the largest reasons that they argued, Congress argued so much about it was that it was just going to cost the earth, they were, they said, um, to again, establish rural free delivery and then to establish um, parcel post. Um, and they also argued that the complicity, there was a lot of complicity with retailers uh, in terms of getting them the federal government to pay for um, parcel posts, you know, and the delivery of these um, packages um, in the absence of um, the freight companies. And uh, the article on the left um, uh, also says that, you know, um, Wanamaker had apparently allegedly said that there he could give you four reasons um, for why there um, should be rural free delivery. Uh, and uh, and those were the um, the four private delivery companies. 
Um, and then the private delivery companies turn back around and say, we'll give you four reasons why um, why not? And it's Wanamaker, 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 and Wanamaker. So um, again, that arguing doesn't ever completely go away um, given the cost, although eventually um, so much business will be generated as a result of this that um, the post office department does quite well for itself. <clears throat> um, this is the Atumwa, Iowa Courier, um, an advertisement where again, they the Phillips Big Store's famous fight with the great catalog and mail order houses is attaining gigantic proportions. Um, and what I have found, especially by um, doing a kind of microcosmic look at these Iowa stores, is that a lot of times the stores would um, uh, would advertise the prices that they were selling things for um, next to then how much the, the goods would cost from a Chicago mail order house and then add on the shipping and they looked like they were offering bigger bargains. Uh, and again, I was am absolutely spoiled for choice because there are so, so many examples of those advertisements. But to a certain extent, um, Sears, uh, uh, Richard Sears, by the kind of 1900 point, had uh, had got, gotten beyond, had grown beyond uh, where Montgomery Ward, Ward's business uh, was at uh, in that period of time, even though Ward's was established in 1872 and was an older company. Um, I think an important point about those is that both of those guys are Midwestern. So they kind of speak to the Midwestern um, population and particularly they say, you know, write your letter in your own words, in your own language. Don't feel badly that you, um, you know, aren't using $5 words and that sort of thing. Um, and that really works uh, to a large extent. Um, um, but Sears unleashes uh, what what retail historians talk of uh, talk about as the, this Iowaization campaign. Um, and that's uh, where, again, I have found, um, I just, these are new, this is new ephemera to me, um, this uh, brochure on the left uh, uh, where people were paid $10 in cash, or you could also take that out in merchandise um, for distributing 25 catalogs to your friends and neighbors. And um, on the right side is, again, the interior of this, where it tells you um, you know, the different classes of rewards that you can, in fact, get. Um, so the genius of this really is um, that it's person to person, right? It's testimonial marketing. It's your friends telling you or your relatives or neighbors that they do this and it's modern and it's great and they're saving all kinds of money. Um, and this is some additional, again, the illustration on the right um, is this um, young fellow, uh, Claude Smith, uh, who's from my hometown, New Hampton, Iowa. Um, and um, the hairs on the back of my neck pricked up when um, I read that. I thought, oh, wow, that's a, an uncanny coincidence. Um, but he talks about how, again, how this was the easiest $10 he's ever made distributing these 25 catalogs. Um, and the ephemera on the left, a letter to a woman in um, Hollisterville, Pennsylvania. So again, this isn't just, they start really targeting uh, consumers in Iowa, but then spread as it gets really successful um, to other states. Um, asking if this woman is in fact interested in distributing catalogs as well. Um, but the tricky thing is that again, um, uh, and I uh, had to cut some stuff out, but um, there were actually in several towns in Cresco, Iowa and Decorah, Iowa, um, hometown boys that would run out of town, the people who were trying to distribute their catalogs. Um, so people were in fact fighting back about the encroachment of the mail order house there. Um, and uh, at a certain point, again, Sears also, um, they try all kinds of um, marketing plans on to see if they'll work. Um, and one of them, you know, again, as they get more and more successful, um, they try to assuage the fears that they are, you know, gobbling up all of this business um, by doing profit sharing. Um, and this, the newspaper on the left is from the Sunny South a newspaper in Atlanta um, from 1907. Uh, and then on the right, several of these uh, profit sharing certificates from my collection um, that uh, give you a sense of what those actually looked like. And then you could cash those in for goods. 
Um, again, ephemera also gives us um, the names of people who were participating in this. Um, in this instance, it also gives us um, some of the envelope stuffers um, that are what the admin called envelope stuffers. Um, um, again, the sort of ephemera that advertise other things that people might be interested in buying. Um, this one, uh, all of these little paint chips um, from a consumer in Ohio from 1907. Um, and and the extent to which again it's exponential the growth that uh, that winds up happening as a result of uh, Sears's Iowaization campaign, um, they literally uh, make millions and millions of dollars as a result of this, um, and we see that reflected in the uh, Postmaster General's report, um, the increases in um, again the numbers of. Um, packages from 1909, uh, and this is from the annual report from 1909, compared to 1905. Um, and the registered letters and packages uh, are increased by 107%. Postal cards are up 410%. Um, circulars are up 136%, and packages 99%. So um, again, that's across, these numbers are across the board, obviously, but mail order clearly plays a fairly significant role in jacking those numbers up. Um, but uh, Des Moines, Iowa has um, a retail trade publisher, journal publisher uh, called William J. Pink, uh, Pilkington, um, who fights back. Um, this uh, this trade journal in Iowa, um, again, uh, centered in Des Moines, which is the state capital, um, begins publication in 1903 under a different editorship, and Pilkington takes over in uh, right around 1905, uh, late 1904, 1905. Um, and Pilkington, again, is taking on um, very proactively um, the mail order catalog houses and how uh, local retailers of um, all stripes can really pr pragmatically fight back. Um, and he does that in the uh, in the trade journal uh, by, again, writing articles and having other people write articles um, that offer very specific tactics um, to, um, you know, to do better advertising, to have better displays. Um, and uh, anyway, he has uh, he's a, an interesting case study in all of this uh, to begin with. And he um, goes so far as to um, take Sears, Roebuck and Company to court, to federal court uh, with the charge of the fraudulent use of mail. Um, and Sears was actually indicted in Iowa in November of 1907. Um, in part because uh, two of the consumers uh, claimed that rings that they had bought uh, were not allegedly as they had been described in the catalog. Um, and these are actually illustrations from the 1906 catalog um, of rings. A lot of times they, they didn't change the merchandise um, or, or all of the merchandise. They would just change the numbers year to year. So um, these are I believe at least comparable in terms of um, the rings that were in question. Um, but it really got national publicity, the idea that um, Davies going up against Goliath here. Um, and while probably Pilkington's attorney was saying, look, this is really just grandstanding, um, the reality was that uh, Sears uh, stock prices dropped when they were indicted uh, in late November, 1907. Um, and in fact, uh, Pilkington's reputation nationally was made, and he goes on tours all over the country then, helping uh, local retailers uh, increase their business. Uh, so by the time that uh, Parcel Post, that legislation is passed, again, the uh, Congress wrangles over that um, throughout the course of the aughts and then into the early teens. Um, and politically, they finally get that job done in 1912, uh, the legislation is passed in 1912, and it rolls out January 1st, 1913, um, so that then mail order houses uh, actively um, integrate that into their catalogs about how you actually have to use parcel post. Um, um, the special stamps that are produced um, and how you have to ship packages so that they can, in fact, be inspected, uh, wrap packages so they can be inspected. 
Um, but the local newspapers, um, in particularly in Iowa, are not having it. <laughs> and um, and they, uh, again, it's really interesting to take a look at the um, more conservative towns and the less conservative, more progressive towns. And, and then even within a town, the more or less conservative or uh, progressive newspapers and and what turns up in their editorializing, especially in their cartoons. Um, the illustration on the left um, has a farmer, again, uh, with a plow, horse and plow, um, who's actually tethered to the mail order house in the distance there um, in the city. Uh, and um, I think that one is uh, certainly caught my attention in terms of, again, how um, the, the, the sensibility is that, in fact, all farmers, um, you know, kind of jump on this bandwagon, uh, when in fact, the reality was that all farmers probably didn't because they couldn't afford to, um, given the vagaries of especially the agricultural uh, economy in this period of time, uh, and then the uh, the and, and the the ad on the left actually ran in a couple of newspapers, Northeast Iowa newspapers, um, in Cresco and in Decora, um, and um, the as did the one on the right. Um, this one particular uh, it, and it, under the headline "The Great Economic Problem," um, this one from the Audubon Iowa Republican newspaper from 1907 where again, the mail order house is the mother pig and then the baby pigs that have been, you know, sort of prematurely weaned off of her um, with this plank of unintentional discrimination are schools, good roads, local improvements, churches, and home industries. Um, so again, very much uh, speaking in vernacular that farm families uh, will understand. Um, and then a nice little case study here. Um, the fellow on the left uh, is called Frank McCreary. He was actually a music professor at um, the then Teachers College in Cedar Falls, uh, which is where I went to college um, at the University of Northern Iowa now. Um, and um, uh, and he was also very actively involved in the Cedar Falls Commercial Club, which is um, kind of precursor to the Chambers of Commerce in a contemporary sense. Um, and their commercial club organized um, a bonfire where uh, people were instructed to bring their mail order catalogs. Um, the local businessmen would give them a token for each catalog they brought in. They would have a big bonfire, burn them, and then um, the people could spend their tokens at the local stores. Um, and that particular theme is then taken up by a novel, uh, well, at first a series of short stories by George Milburn, and then a novel that's published in the mid-1930s called Catalog. Um, that, uh, full disclosure, ends with some fairly graphic racial violence. Um, so these issues are very much on people's minds uh, in the really the first third of the 20th century as we uh, evolve through it. Um, then there's... Um, uh, a New England publisher called Frank Swallow, um, who uh, um, does a whole series of these really funny, humorous postcards. Um, this one, um, it took so much time to read the postcards, and now we must find out what's inside all of the parcel post packages mm -hmm. uh, so that we have the postmaster and his assistant looking at what, uh, you know, what people are ordering. Um, so even though at, at certain points, uh, mail order houses will offer to send things in a plain brown wrapper, it didn't really matter because those packages had to be inspected. So, Sarah, um, excuse me. Um, we're, um, we've only got about a minute left. Um, so if you could okay. begin to wrap yep. up, that would be helpful. Thank you. I sure will. I will just whiz through these, uh, Ding Darling uh, is better known for his duck stamps, uh, does some cartoons for the Des Moines Register there where the middlemen are getting bounced over with goods. Parcel Post then in popular culture, a postcard and in sheet music, Sam Sam, the Parcel Post man. Um, silent film, a rural free delivery romance. Um, and when delivery went terribly wrong, this consumer, Sears consumer, uh, 1925, uh, where they sure give it the old college try to get it to him. And then the dead parcel post packaging, um, the packages that couldn't be delivered. Uh, we're almost at the end, I promise. There we go. Thank you all for attending. Uh, public history, I'm convinced, takes a village. If anybody has family photos or information, pro or anti, 
RFD or parcel post, please let me know. Um, I'm grateful for the research uh, support I've gotten from the State Historical Society of Iowa, and many thanks to all of the ephemera dealers, previous scholars, and especially digitization projects um, that allow us to work from home so much of the time. Thank you so much. Can't hear you. Mike, we can't hear you. All right, um, how's that? Yep, yep. Um, as I was saying, Sarah, this is a very interesting talk and in many ways predates uh, much of what we face as consumers um, in the 21st century. And I should add too that um, uh, I attended Wartburg College and uh, my wife grew up in Fredericksburg, ah, Iowa. So uh, nice. we're, we're, we're close neighbors in that regard. Um, one of the questions that was sent from our audience, and I'm going to read it because it speaks to a number of things that you you said, and um, uh, I'd like to hear your, your, your brief thoughts on them. Montgomery Ward and later Sears, both in Chicago, were formed to be mail order companies. That is, you know, they, they began as mail order company, and they offered it items in catalogs. But um, oftentimes they would engage in sending substitutes. They would bait and switch. Now that brings us, um, um, so did their giant size move the government to open postal delivery? That's the first part of, uh, that's one of the questions. So um, did the size of these corporations, uh, these mail order houses, uh, did that kind of uh, encourage the government to open postal delivery? Um, well, there was there was certainly a lot of lobbying, you know, then as now in Washington D.C. in terms of you know in terms of that sort of thing, and lobbying on the the opposite side, you know the. Um, uh, so, so there's that certainly going on. Um, the, the stores, so direct marketing, what, you know, what in business parlance is called direct marketing, which is where, um, people can't actually come to a physical store and buy things. You know, it's just stuff is just being shipped out like Amazon in a contemporary sense. Yeah. Um, uh, so those, um, Montgomery Ward and Sears actually both open retail locations in the 1920s and 1930s. Um, again, to participate, you know, to broaden out their appeal. Yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, um, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, anyway, in oh. terms of bait and switch, I think that that's what this, um, the case that Pilkington um, brings against, you know, against Sears is about. Um, yeah. The misrepresentation in one case of jewelry and in the other case of paint, that it yeah. wasn't uh, lead-based paint. That, um, that led to our next question. And that was, it seems as though that was the basis for uh, Pilkington's um, uh, lawsuit. Um, and ironically, too, our, our, our first questioner points out that, um, you know, Sears survives mostly as a re retail store uh, in yeah. the end, um, whereas, you know, Montgomery Ward is, is slower to change. Um, and anybody who grew up in a rural area, particularly in Iowa, knows that the um, Sears catalog uh, served a very basic function um, uh, in, in an outhouse. Um, that's all I'll say. That too. Yeah. It, and it, what what's interesting about your research and your presentation is that it really predates the whole situation with Amazon versus um, mm -hmm. um, um, you know local stores and that sort of thing. I mean, it's almost as if history is repeating itself here. Yeah, that's that's exactly right. In the in the 1990s, um, a, a similar kind of movement was uh, being directed against Walmart again, as they were particularly going after, you know, they were um, getting uh you know, Chinese and other majority world country um, companies to manufacture things for them much, much more cheaply than American firms could do and just driving, you know, American companies out of business. Um, well, so there's, again, there's a whole, you know, anti-Walmart movement that gets kicked off by the mid 1990s as well. So yeah, absolutely. But I, I think with when Amazon started with their own vans, you know, that's, yeah. um, that it gives them then the control uh, that they don't have if they're yeah. outsourcing that to FedEx or UPS or whatever. Well, and, and that 1990s conflict reminds me, and I, I made a note of this, that, um, you know, the previous administration in Washington wanted to charge Amazon uh, much higher rates 
um, than the standard rates of of the United uh, the the U.S. postal system. And uh, the previous administration even went so far as to um, install a, a postmaster general who might be um, somewhat um, uh, amenable um, to that that yes. request. Um, but in any event, um, we have uh, th this is a fascinating, um, a very fertile to use a Midwestern uh, reference subject. And um, we must stop, alas. So I will end by um, uh, our, our final uh, comment here from our audience. Um, and I'll read it. And it says, bravo, Sarah. Great and informal, informative presentation. So, Sarah, thank you so much. Thanks very much, everyone. And if anyone has material, please let me know, um, uh, because this work is really ongoing. So thank you so very much. Good. And now we'll take a short break and we'll be back at 3.30. And thank you all. Uh, and do please come back for our next presentation.